them introduce themselves because I, you know before the other panels were run by journalists who uh, many times say like, oh, you're such an amazing, wonderful person. Tell us why, right? Uh, but I think we, you know since I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I know that I'm, I have many flaws, and I'm sure everybody on this panel here has a lot of flaws too. And we're all just you know people with some good things, some bad things. Rather than tell you all these wonderful things about themselves, I thought the first thing, if you just would like to give us a, you know, your own fair, honest introduction about yourselves uh, for a couple of <laughs> minutes, and then we go on. So let me start with you, Joichi. Hey, but you told us actually to be boastful because none of these people <laughs> know who we are. So I will be slightly uncharacteristically Jap un Japanese. Mm. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an internet entrepreneur, and I started a lot of companies in Japan first, the first uh, internet service provider, the first web uh, company, and uh, a lot of things after that. But recently, I'm an investor, early stage investor, so I uh, did Flickr, Last FM. Is, uh, is he mic'd well? So apart. You're, you're not mic'd well, okay. Yeah. Take this one. All right. I'll, I'll, okay. All right, I'll just get you. And um, Last FM, Technorati, Fun, mm -hmm. uh, many other companies, but I spend actually most of my time doing nonprofit stuff because I think that we're successful at doing the internet because the internet is open. And most of the nonprofit I, work I do is to try to keep the internet open. And my main job is actually CEO of Creative Commons, which is kind of to content what uh, HTML is to websites and TCP IP is to computers. Very well. Thanks for the intro. Bernard? I don't know. I don't need the microphone. Just go one, two, three. OK. OK. Um, so Bernard Luquet, I'm Swiss. Uh, father of two kids. Um, I lived since uh, 10 years in Russia, uh, had the, there three different jobs. Uh, I was involved with Ozone.ru, which is the biggest e-commerce site in Russia since the year 2000, when it got its first um, round of financing. And I'm running the company formally since 2005. Uh, Ozone is, um, by international standards, still a very small business. We did 66 million last year but we grew the business by 93%, which uh, shows um, that we're just scratching the surface, and I think there's an enormous potential out there. We process uh, 5,000 orders a day, uh, mainly you know, uh, media products like goods, music, and recently started also electronics and, um, and uh, expanded our product lines. Uh, the particularity is that we had to set up businesses that also deliver these orders to the, to the clients because there are some hurdles to entry in such a market, and so we had to you know, take care about the different stages of the business processes. Um, yeah. Very well. That's Thanks, it. Bernard. Matt? Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Flannery. I'm an Irish American, just like the three presidential candidates. Um, <laughs> and along with my wife, I started a nonprofit called Kiva. We're based in San Francisco but we work in 40 countries and we're about three years old. Um, we started Kiva in Uganda, and it's a Swahili word, which means agreement. And essentially what Kiva is, is a person-to-person -person lending website. So we took the movement of microfinance, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, microfinance and Dr. Yunus, um, Nobel Peace Prize winner. We took that work and put it online for the first time so actually people can lend to other people on the internet for the sake of alleviating poverty. And we've been around for about 30 months. And we are in 40 countries and have done about $30 million in loans and are growing pretty fast. It's, it's, it's scaling pretty quick now. That's phenomenal. Yes. Uh, I'm Sanjeev Bikchandani. Uh, I spent all my life in India. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur since 1990. And for the first seven years, we did other stuff. It was a small company running out of my house. Uh, in 97, we launched our first website, uh, Nokri, a job site. Uh, and you know, right place, right time, got lucky, worked hard, worked smart. The business just took off. Uh, we subsequently raised venture capital, and now we, we also listed uh, on the Indian Stock Exchange. We now uh, run uh, seven classified websites, jobs, real estate, matrimonials, uh, a few others. Uh, we, we, we employ about 1,600 people, and we run out of 67 offices uh, in 41 cities in India. Very well, thank you, Sanjeev. So this morning, the, I wanted to start the panel because this morning we heard about how phenomenal and fantastic what the mobile world was, you know, and how the mobile operators were helping change elections and were doing all these great things. But before the session, some of us got together 
Uh, and we, were, we actually had some criticism of that view in the sense that we, we seem to feel more comfortable with the open internet than with the internet that comes through a mobile phone, right? That was the general topic that we spoke about. And we have uh, issues here. We have a person from Russia who's, uh, who's very active, uh, well, working in Russia, Japan, India, myself from Spain. And, and we, had, we had criticism, not that we don't think the mobile world uh, does great things, because it does, but, but other than occasionally or frequently people ripping people off, the question is really more, uh, you know, how does the internet appear in the mobile world? And what can the mobile world, can it deliver the, inter the internet we like? So first I thought I would ask Joichi that question. Do you think the mobile world, because in Japan it is so big, uh, what's happening in Japan and does, it, does the internet, is the future of the internet uh, mo controlled by mobile operators or open? So, so first of, to define the internet we like. I think the internet we like is an internet that's open, that anyone can participate without asking permission. If it weren't for that fact, we wouldn't have Google. The telephone company would be making the search engine. That was the idea before the internet, was the telephone company makes a search engine, they make everything, right? And Japan is arguably the most advanced in mobile. One of the reasons was because there was no free market. There was Dokomo, it was a monopoly, they subsidized the phones. And in a closed garden, you can be somewhat efficient. Just like certain countries that don't have democracies, dictatorships are often more efficient than democracies. But the thing that's very interesting, so because of that, in the US you have too much market and you have this horrible mobile network. But, it, but in Japan, what, what happened was we moved very far ahead. So we, we, but the mobile companies make tons of monies, money and they're, they're not our internet. You can't, at certain layers of the mobile networks in any country, there really isn't very much innovation. It's the big companies, the vendors charging a lot of money and, and so on. And so the real fear, and, and, the, and the market knows this in Japan, there's a, one of the largest social network sites, Mixi, um, has its internet web traffic is going down and its mobile traffic is going up. And mobile now is more than half of its traffic. And the Japanese government announced recently that more people access the internet by mobile phones than from the, the, the computer. So Mixi's market cap is going down, obviously, because mobile doesn't monetize as well. And all of the money that goes to mobile carriers, most of it goes into the data traffic and, the f and, and into the but, carriers. But mobile monetizes well. We see it, for example, at phone when we use SMS payments for Wi-Fi signal. The problem is that it monetized 70 percent for the mobile right. operator. And, and, and you know, I'm not trying to toot Google's horn, but when Google makes a lot of the money, it goes back into the market. You know, they buy, I'm on the board of the Mozilla Foundation, and we get a lot of money from Google because of the traffic and things like this. It, it, there's a nice ecology of startups. Whereas the money that goes into the mobile carriers goes into this kind of very closed economy of large corporations that don't drive innovation. And so in Japan, you don't see very many startups, except in the very thin content layer all the mobile innovation still happens in this very old style. So I think that everybody thinks that mobile is very sexy and they're trying to rush into it. But I think the market is saying you don't make as much money on mobile. And in fact, from the, from the venture perspective, until mobile opens up, until we get Wi-Fi or WiMAX or something slightly less regulated than these carriers, we might end up where the DNA of the network underneath us is not the internet we like. And that DNA can contaminate the layers above very quickly once you get stuck in this wall garden, which is the carriers. So I'm, I'm actually afraid of the move into mobile and let, until we get the l lower layers open more quickly. More. And Sanjeev, what do you think is happening in India? Well, in India, there are different problems. Um, in India, most of the mobile phones are not so advanced so that you can surf the internet because people want cheaper mobile phones. Uh, it's not such a rich country. Secondly, if you look at you know, even this screen, which is one of the larger screens, it's surfing the internet is not a great experience. Uh, you know, the, the mobile phones are used more or less to receive your emails or maybe a couple of important newsletters, but when you try and surf a site, it's not a great experience. So from a user experience perspective, I don't think mobile is going to take off. Sec the second point is that we have a whole lot of small uh, vast companies, value-added services, and there you have the same problem. Wherever the, mo the mobile phone company is collecting the money and wherever the mobile phone co company owns the customer, uh, they are hogging 70 or 80% of the revenue, which means that these companies don't get enough to make enough profits to reinvest and to grow. So really, it's about, uh, it's about the operator. Yes. And uh, how about uh, selling uh, goods in Russia? How is it helpful? Is the mobile network helpful? Do you do a lot of your sales over mobile? Do you do them over... Yeah. 
we are not yet uh, doing a lot of sales over mobile. I have to say the, the mo mobile phenomena in Russia has just started. Uh, there are a tremendous investment being done in, in, in the infrastructure, being uh, going to the regions a little bit with the same issue that we heard this morning about uh, India, where you don't have enough uh, fixed infrastructure and then it gets supplanted by mobile infrastructure. Um, but um, also coming back to this comment about the cost of roaming, all of you who have ever traveled to Russia and tried to call abroad were probably shocked to see their bill when they came back. And this is something which uh, is really an issue now. I think, the, uh, for example, in terms of using mobiles for payments, uh, we, are, we see very strong limitations in, in Russia due to the, the percent or the commission that the mobile op operator would take on this transaction. It's uh, above 50%. So in our case, uh, in our company, which uh, we take 80% of the, the income in cash and delivery. Uh, this is actually not an alternative because it's cheaper for us to take cash than to pay 50% commission about right. mobile operators. So it's about, uh, it's about competition and costs going down and basically liberalizing the market. Uh, okay, and th another question on Russia because this morning we had many parts of the world represented but we didn't have, we didn't have Russia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I we, was we thinking... We heard a few comments. Though. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I was thinking about Russia in the sense that um, let's say that the Chinese like to call their government a democracy and the Russians like to call their government a democracy, and some of us have doubts, okay? Um, <laughs> but having said that, if you are less, if you are not democratic, to me a democracy, an essential element is an election whose outcome is uncertain. Let's just begin with that. <laughs> And uh, I, I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a lot of uncertainty coming up of China and Russia. But uh, having, having said all this, I am surprised because the internet in Russia, while there, everybody talks about the Great Red Wall of, of firewall of China and all the censorship in China, I really, on, on all the negative things I hear about Russia, I really never heard of anybody saying that the internet is in Russia like it is in China. Is that true? What, what, what is your opinion? Yeah, my opinion uh, is that uh, it is certainly different from China. Uh, I don't think there is a, uh, any active censorship going on. There is probably what I would call a post-moderation. Yeah. <laughs> you can call it that way. So mm -hmm. you still have to take care about what you publish. Mm -hmm. But there is no upfront censorship. And uh, you see it uh, at a different level also about the political debate. Uh, I think the political debate- So first debate you post and then the Plutonian. Well, <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> no, but I, I think the, um, the internet is still in, in Russia um, a very uh, media which is much less controlled than the other media. That's 100% sure. And uh, there was a bill recently which excluded uh, the internet from, from the so-called strategic sectors in which uh, foreign investment would be restricted. And the internet is not in there. So this is another good news. Um, so I believe in that sense, uh, Russia is closer to probably a certain ideal which you, you have about uh, and what the, are, the liberty what of about, speech. No, no, I, look, Fonis Mu is going into Russia. We're going into Russia this year, and I'm, I'm very intrigued, right? Yeah. So you're an expert. I'm a, a newcomer, and I, I just want to know about whether I can speak freely. And the other thing I would like to know is what about all these things you hear that if you're a businessman in Russia that your personal safety may not be the best and all this do you um, feel comfortable? Do you walk around without bodyguards? You um, maybe I can I can show a few slides. Yes, just, yes. Uh, please describing please how I how I feel Russia looks like today. This is my uh, my own personal view. Please, uh, please. Yeah. I'm Swiss, so I'm neutral. Um, <laughs> 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 so the first slide is actually was taken a week ago by an unknown for amateur photographer. Should we go to the? Uh, are we seeing the first this one? one? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, it was during the military parade. As you know, there was this first time since 1990 when uh, Russia uh, sent the big military parade over the Red Square. And I like this shot because basically it shows two trends which are very important in Russia. It's basically, since collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia came back to its root, uh, spiritual roots also. The religion plays a, long, uh, a strong job, but also uh, cultural roots. This is the first part of the, of the picture. The second one is obviously military strength, and not only military strength. I think the government, since uh, Mr. Putin, has been doing a lot to reinforce Russia's position on the world. Also economically, we talk a lot about military and there are obviously different me, uh, opinions there, but you have to be aware that Russia has an agenda for having its place in the economic area of the world. And Russian companies, Russian groups do not hesitate to look abroad, eventually look for investments abroad. They're very 
open and they want to contribute I think, and participate in the world economy. That's the first trend. Now, coming to the next slide about the internet, um, just maybe I'll do it immediately like this. Yeah, the next one, please. It's actually, yeah. Okay, that one. It's actually about two countries. When you have Moscow, where broadband penetration is already at the level of 50%, Moscow today is a bigger internet market than all of Sweden, which is the, the, where the internet penetration is the highest. And the whole of Russia has already 130, uh, sorry, 30 million internet users, which is a little bit bigger than France, and yet a little bit smaller than Germany, but growing at 20% per year. So there is an interesting market there, and I think uh, uh, this path at which it grows, it's not China, but it's something which will become very big. Now, talking about the next slide, um, the President Medvedev, um, this is a speech he delivered totally unexpectedly. Uh, about a month ago at the Russian Internet Forum. The Russian Internet Forum is a, um, a conference that happens since 10 years outside of Moscow in a kind of a sanatorium. And there was a whole panic uh, six hours before the beginning because uh, President Medvedev had announced that he would come make the opening speech. And actually... He invited himself. He invited himself <laughs> and shared some interesting, uh, some interesting uh, insights uh, and what actually you have to know is that he um, is very much intrigued and interested in this technology. He claims that every morning when he gets up, he gets his news um, on the internet before the briefing. And uh, he was also wondering why he has so many uh, clones on his social networks using his <laughs> names. So it's an interesting step that actually Putin would probably not have made, but Medvedev came to this internet forum, which I think is an interesting, an interesting trend. And then I just want to show uh, one more picture, which is um, e-commerce in Russia versus e-commerce in Germany, for example. Uh, and why are we there and why uh, do we believe in, in the business that you know, only 4% currently of Russians buy online versus already 60 uh, in Great Britain or Germany? And there is a huge potential there. But there are some barriers to entry. And uh, one of the barriers to entry is infrastructure and the problem that the infrastructure are not adapted with the, the current enormous economic growth, which is country experiment. And traffic is a problem in most of the cities in Europe. But I mean, coming here in a taxi and the taxi driver was worried about the traffic jams around Moscow. I told him, you know, when you send, spend three hours in a 20 lane street blocked in traffic jam in Moscow, then you understand how far this can go in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure not being adapted to the growth. But maybe traffic jams are good because people will shop on the internet. Exactly. They so don't I think get stuck <laughs> on the traffic jam. <laughs> using the mobile phone. Mm. Using yeah. the mobile when you're phone. Stuck in the yeah. <laughs> no, I think in this country, for this reason and other, con mm. and other reasons, uh, probably the change in the way of shopping, um, uh, there will be a step change going faster towards e commerce ver versus retail, where you still need to go to the place. And when you, when you <coughs> see this kind of traffic problem or the distances in Russia, I think e-commerce there has a and in general, ahead. in general, uh, Russia ten years from now, yeah. will it look more like Europe or more like China? That is, um, you know, there is this Russian say no, that. Of course, of course, you don't know, but just your opinion. No, but <laughs> Russia always, historically, it has been very stable. Always, it opens and closes. Mm -hmm. Opens and closes. Uh, since Gorbachev it opened, now okay. there are some fears that it's in a closing phase again. We will see what happens, uh, but. In 10 years from now, it will actually depend if we're in a cycle of opening or a cycle of closing. <coughs> uh, so I don't have an answer. I think uh, it, it, will, it will go on like this, by waves. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, my grandmother had to escape uh, Russia um, in, during the time of uh, Stalin, Lenin, and uh, she had very strong things to say about so did my uh, Russia, yeah. <laughs> but it, but so, so obviously Russia has been through tremendous cycles, but my hope is that this European idea is contagious. My hope, I think in Europe we have done the most wonderful thing in the world, which is to take a lot of different people who used to fight each other all the time and do business and get along and allow people to move from a country to another one as opposed to NAFTA, let's say, where it seems to be designed to keep the Mexicans in Mexico, you know. <laughs> we, allow, we allow people to move around, you know, and, and I, hopefully Russia will be part of the European Union and will be in, in, and will be in better shape. Now let's switch to Kiva now, you know, because we've been kind of ignoring you and that's not fair. <laughs> I think we should, we should, I think you're doing something great. And you were very, before you told me, should I show the slides? I shouldn't show the slides. Show the slides. Show us what Kiva is. Does this work? I think yeah, so. I, it was prepared for you. Slide. Kiva slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. great. Um, 
really quick. Let's make this fast. That's what our site has looked like between um, September and February. Basically, it was sold out of loans about half the time during that period. Um, that's because Bill Clinton mentioned Kiva on the Oprah Winfrey show, and we were sold out. So we're a philanthropic website that denied your ability to, um, to be philanthropic. And that, that's one of the first times in history a website has done that. Usually, they want to take money. But um, let's go to the next slide. OK. That one. You might find that works a little bit. OK, we'll try both at once. Um, <laughs> so really quick, we're built on the movement of microfinance. Half the world lives on less than $2 a day, and they work in the informal economy. Um, that figure, about $2, might be changing now that the dollar is changing. Uh, we'll see about that. But uh, microfinance loans help people in the informal sector start businesses and grow their businesses. And Kiva works on top of that. We were, um, my wife and I were working in Uganda at the time when we started it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, really quick, we're an online marketplace where we let local partners, MFIs like that one right there at Adelante, post the loans of their borrowers in their village, wherever they happen to be. Um, they do it on the internet. Um, usually there is an internet connection somewhere in these developing countries. Um, and we're just getting into the area of using mobile phones, so you actually won't have to use the internet to use our website from Honduras or Cambodia, wherever you happen to be. And we have about 300,000 lenders. Next slide. Um, let's skip this slide really quick. <laughs> we don't have much time. Let's, let's keep going. So that's a picture of our home page and how it works. Um, here's a borrower. This is a sample borrower. This is um, a borrower in Kenya. She's selling a hybrid goat. I mean, she has a, a business where she's buying a hybrid goat and selling it. She got a loan on our site. I don't know what a hybrid goat is. I think well, it's yeah. I was going to ask that. Little, well, it's, it's like a, a sheep goat. It's a little bit more efficient than the average goat <laughs> of some sort. Yeah. It's like the internet. Yeah. It's my, my like my Lexus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So next slide. <laughs> But that's a very popular business. The African woman is actually the most popular on our website. She'll raise money about 10 times faster than an Eastern European man on our website really? for some reason. Um, we raise Why? about $100,000 a day <laughs> right now on our site, and Africans raise the mo the, that the fastest. This is a, um, a butcher in Kabul. Um, our users don't like meat-based businesses as much, so he was less popular than a farmer that does uh, mm -hmm. agriculture. Um, next one. This is a woman in Kirkuk. So we started working in Iraq uh, late last year. Um, last year, And um, the, in Kirkuk, they actually masked the identities of the borrowers because it didn't seem very, very good that they were funded by Americans in their, in their town. So they, they actually protected their an anonymity. But we had actual Americans funding Iraqis this way. And actual American soldiers were funding Iraqis this way. So really great. Um, cross-cultural experience. Next slide. But, but this is not philanthropy, right? You expect to make your money back with interest, right? Or you give it, or you give it up. What, what happens to your money? It's social lending. So it's a 0% interest loan. You actually, 0 percent interest. Right. We're working to provide interest later, but the regulations are pretty difficult in all these 40 countries around taking interest rates out of the country. So we've, we've stuck at a 0% interest level, and we've been almost sold out at that level. So I suspect when we offer interest, It'll be uh, quite fast. But here are some numbers just to, just to um, illustrate how we're growing. Um, in about 30 months, about, 12 million, 12, about $1 million every 12 days. Um, we're about 25 employees in San Francisco. We have a 97% repayment rate. So interesting thing, the world's poor actually pay back at high rates. They're very good credit risk, not a subprime loan. Mm -hmm. um, better pay back than US uh, mortgages, I think. And, um, we're a pretty efficient organization, like, like Craigslist or an internet public good. We are pretty lean on staff, and we send about $10 to the poor for about every $1 we spend on our own salaries and flying to England and going to these conferences. But uh, I suspect in about five years, we'll have done about uh, $1 billion in loans. So this is a, a real force. Personal lending internationally is going to become a sizable um, force in the philanthropic landscape. And Kiva itself is an NGO or a corporation? We are an NGO. You're an NGO. We are a nonprofit. Okay. We are yeah, a very good. almost cash flow break even mm. nonprofit. Very good, very yeah. good. So it's a sustainable NGO that right. gets a, a little part of the loan to sustain itself, but it's not, it's not a business. And the, and it's the a lending social is business. done at no interest. Yeah. Social business that takes 0% interest loans um, mm. back and forth. 
And what if some people would argue that this type of, uh, <coughs> how does this, does this crowd out any type of other lending that could take place, or these people would otherwise never get a loan? Well, uh, the need for microloans worldwide is gigantic, mm. and it's a really profitable and sustainable activity. Um, it's about, it's only being met about 20% of the total market. So there's a lot, a lot of room to grow all over the world. It's a big world, so we're not crowding out anyone. The main competition is just inactivity, actually. And uh, moving to India a little bit, this morning we heard uh, something that I found striking, which is that there's many, more or less as many people on the internet now as, as there's not people on the internet in India, right? So I, I was really shocked that, wow, like if all of India would go on the internet, we would double the people in the world on the internet, right? Now, probably the main reason why people are not in the internet, or so many people are not in the inter internet in India, is poverty, right? It probably doesn't have to do with choice, consumer choice, think, right? Uh, yeah, that's they have one not reason. rejected the internet, they just have basis, basic necessities of life that haven't been fulfilled. So I was wondering that other than your activities in FinfoEdge, do you, are you involved in, in not-for-profit or, or certain type of organizations like Eva? Um, you know, in, in, in my case, I, I run two foundations and I, I'm very involved and I've spoken to many entrepreneurs from, from countries like my country, Argentina or uh, India because I'm both Argentine and Spanish but I do my philanthropy in Argentina and you find that the entrepreneurs in many of these countries are really not thinking about philanthropy at all, right? And they're very focused on making money, but, I, but, I, but that's beginning to change, partly because of something like the like Clinton Global Initiative that, or the Americans, which really make you feel that you're not really rich until you give out a big portion of your fortune. And, and uh, so the Chinese want to be rich, and soon they're going to find out that they're only rich when they give it away, right? <laughs> and uh, so how, how is the environment in India? Would a Kiva be successful in India? What, no. what is happening in India to bring these billion people? Uh, well, well uh, I think a lot of the things that's happening in India is government effort. There are a lot of NGOs also working. Uh, having said that, philanthropy among business houses has exi existed, but it's not as if people have given away everything and, you know, it's, it's not like it is in the U.S. So no great big universities, very few of them been, have been endowed with great endowments. But I think a lot of that is changing. Uh, I think with the new generation of entrepreneurs, uh, especially the IT entrepreneurs who are first generation entrepreneurs, are, are, they're, be they're doing a lot of philanthropy. Uh, I myself am involved with an NGO that, uh, I'm on the board of an NGO that works with rag pickers. Uh, these are people who recycle waste uh, and make a living out of it. Uh, so, so environmental waste management, uh, is, uh, urban environmental waste management is a, is a big thing for that, for that NGO and I'm deeply involved. Uh, I'm also involved with a group that uh, is trying to put together a university and on the model of an American university which gets endowments from private sectors. So that's very initial. So I'm doing a couple of things. Uh, we recently also, uh, you know, uh, as part of the company activity, not my personal activity, we, we, we worked with a, a job fair for disabled people. Uh, and that was quite successful. So that, that was in partnership with an NGO. So we're doing three or four things. Uh, we are also uh, introducing, you know, we have a resume database of 13 million resumes growing at, you know, 10 or 12,000 resumes a day. And for the last year, we've been picking up certain data uh, which will enable us, uh, maybe six months from now, to offer an affirmative action uh, search of resumes. So, so you, know, you have 30 million resumes one in three, your... One three. One three. 13 yeah. million yes. resumes in your... Well, Growing at about 10,000 mm. a day. Uh, That's more like in many countries in Europe. I mean, just people, all of them. Yeah. So it's a very impressive. <laughs> so, mm. so uh, you know, we, we, we pick up data of people who are differently able. We pick up gender data. We pick up... Uh, uh, you know, in India, there's this whole thing of caste discrimination. Uh, we pick up uh, data about uh, if people belong to the less privileged caste. Uh, we haven't yet opened these out for searching yet. Uh, How do people, people know what caste you belong to? Uh, most people know it. Mm. How? It, it, comes, it comes from the family. I mean, you know it. But you're, in, you're looking for a job, you're in a website, and you, you say, oh, how can you tell that somebody well, belongs well, to No, we caste? don't ask you a specific caste. Uh, mm. There's a group of castes which regulation in India has classified as uh, less privileged. And if but you, in your job site, do people have to disclose what caste no, they belong they, to? No, we ask, are you from one of the less privileged castes, yes or no? I see. Okay, and so, so if uh, when we open it out... And people see, want to say they're part of the less privileged? Uh, well, if it helps them get a job, they do say it. Okay. Okay, and it is a social reality, it does exist. So the government is taking strong steps and has been taking for many years, but the numbers are so large that you know, it, it's a big problem to overcome. So uh, we are going to be uh, launching this affirmative action search within about six to eight months. So these are three or four things we're doing. Very good. 
Once Joichi, you told me that in Japan they have an yeah, issue so with cats, just, right? It's just funny because I just want to, I know the Japanese uh, will this hate is something me again like people, for this, but people don't so know that Joichi once told me, I was very... Yeah, so it's the opposite. So we have a caste system in Japan that's very well hidden, but the HR divisions of government agencies and big companies know it. And if you're un from an underprivileged caste, it's very difficult to get married. It's very difficult or impossible to get a job in a public company. And if you're from the left wing, it's almost impossible to get a job even if your parents were from the left, subside the left wing newspaper. So there's a lot of discrimination in Japan that's kind of hidden. And so we don't have this affirmative action because it's sort of hidden. And the, the, the other thing just in terms of the censorship, right? So you think Japan maybe is a democracy. Well, and this is a, a good example of the carriers. The Japanese government said, oh, let's do censorship. And everybody's, the politicians said, good idea. So the first thing they did was all the carriers, unless you're, if you're a minor, now you cannot access a, any normal adult web page. There's a whole content filtering, and of course the carriers. Oh, okay, we're fine, you know. And so, so the carriers rolled over. The, they're trying to censor the internet now, the websites, and so and the websites are fighting against this. But so you think of Japan as kind of this progressive modern democracy, but we discriminate maybe worse than India in many cases, and we were doing internet censorship like the, the Communication Decency Act in the United States. You know, you're with, depriving children of pornography. I mean, yeah, it's really exactly. bad. <laughs> I'm but, kidding. But but, but but it's 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 you know it's it's really going backwards, and, and to just to make this tie this to my original point, you know, if you're trying to fight for censorship on the internet, it's a very difficult fight. But if you're trying to fight for censorship on mobile carriers, it's not that difficult fight because there are just three companies that are very close to the government. You know? No, I, I read the other day that Pew, you know, the Pew Institute comes up with these polls that are, I always find shocking, like they do a fake election in, in Pakistan and they show that Osama bin Laden would win the election or these this wonderful findings of the Pew Institute. And the last one that I, that I saw that was shocking, they, they asked a lot of Chinese people, do you think uh, censorship is, uh, is a, a good thing to, prefer, uh, to preserve harmony? And over 80% of the Chinese people were in favor of censorship. So I, I, was, I was shocked. I don't know if it's properly phrased, but maybe are we from the West just trying to, you well, know? Well, the, the, one of the leading universities that I, mm -hmm. I'm also teaching at, um, they did a, one of the business schools did a poll of the students and they said, who should be running the internet? And the majority said the police. The police. <laughs> this is, this, I mean, this a, so there's a very different kind of internet consumer in Japan. It's probably the last job they want anyway. Move over, Larry and Sergey. Here's some uh, policemen coming over to run the company. No, I, 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 I think that uh, people have really weird ideas about the internet, that's for sure. And um, no, what, what, what I was wondering, going back to the Kiva model is that one region of the world that has been uh, not mentioned today at all, and it's where I come from, is Latin America. Uh, do you guys do anything in Latin America, and, um, and what do you think about, uh, uh, is you showed the Kabul, uh, the guy in Kabul, the other one was in Africa, what about um, mis amigos, you know, are you lending to them? <laughs> For sure, I had to cut the slides down. I had many about Latin America. We're working in Paraguay, we're working in Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, Dominican Republic. Actually, Peru is the, the largest country on our site in terms of dollars raised. So Mexico is very big, too. We have Mexico. Peru, the largest. In very terms good. of dollars, yes. OK, yes. very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were saying what you were saying before is true, that when you show people living on $2 a day, I was thinking that the Brazilian real, for example, used to be close to 4 to 1. Now it's 170 to 1. So the dollar is going down so much against the country, the country supposedly less developed that soon everybody will live on $2 a day. They, they just won't make a living, you know. <laughs> and um, and, and uh, a question about, about democracy in general, like what people like me who love democracy are kind of hurt by this thing that China, that's not a democracy, even though they say it is, um, is doing, really seems to be doing much better than India, who is a democracy and Russia who's kind of moving away from democracy. But when you look at Putin, I was looking at the GDP when Putin started and the GDP now, and it went up 10 times. So it's, there's obviously something that non-democracies are doing well, like, like you know? Apple. And, hmm? Like Apple. Like Apple, yeah. It's closed, but it's doing yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, it's closed and it's doing very well. The shares went back up to 190. Uh, so the question here for India, you know, is does, do you feel is India be, be helped by being a democracy, or you, do you sometimes feel you had like a, a Chinese 
you know, style, you know, authoritarian person running your country? No way. Mm. Look, with a democracy, what happens is it takes a long time to initiate something because there's a lot of debate before you initiate reform or before you restructure or before you privatize. There's a lot of debate. But once you do it and the debate's done with, there's a buy-in at all levels. So it is not reversed so easily. Uh, the problem with uh, a, th a totalitarian system is that if you're stuck with the wrong dictator, you're finished. Yes. Right? right? So that's a huge risk. Uh, and, and, you know... No, I like what the gentleman said this morning, Mo Ibrahim, about these people who think that because they were great leaders, they're great administrators. And yeah, what right. people fall in love with a leader idea and then the country goes to hell. Yeah, and you know, in India what's happened is, mm -hmm. I think over the last 60 years since independence, I think democracy has gone down to the roots. So there is, I, I think there's only been a two year period when there was an internal emergency imposed in the mid 70s and the people throughout the government. And uh, you know, in the last, I think 10 elections, uh, the government has changed every time. Uh, so people want change. Uh, people love democracy too much and there's no way they'll give it up in India. Very well.